Welcome to New York, welcome to Mike Novogratz, he's the president of Fortress and welcome to another series of the Opalesk 5 Minutes. And I'm very pleased to be together with Mike here in this Fortress office right above New York and I'm very curious to hear from Mike, how did you get started in hedge funds and in trading? Because Mike, not only he's at the helm of Fortress, but he also runs his own macro hedge fund. Mike, so how did you get started with trading? You know, I started uh, on Wall Street April 1st of 1989. It was April Fool's Day, and I started at Goldman Sachs as a money market salesman. You know, money markets was a pretty easy job. Uh, it started early, it ended by noon. But it was a great uh, entry to Wall Street because you're learning financing and you're getting your feet with without having to work that hard. Uh, but after a couple years, I really had a, a yearning to go overseas, and so I kept applying for jobs to try to get in the emerging market desk uh, or something that would take me overseas and uh, finally I got on the non-dollar sales desk at Goldman and uh, one day John Corzine who was the boss called me up and sent me to Tokyo uh, and I was in Tokyo in 1992-93 and I started covering the hedge funds. So at that point hedge funds didn't have big institutional desks. Uh, I call a lot of the guys at home. I remember calling Lee Cooperman and waking him up in the middle of the night almost every night. Uh, Jimmy Leitner, Paul Jones and really started uh, asking these guys, you know, how they got their start. And 93, 94 was really the first big era where hedge fund guys publicly were making a whole lot of money. And so there was an excitement around the business. Goldman Sachs at that point had a huge surge in proprietary trading. And there were proprietary traders that were getting paid fortunes relative to what I was making as a salesman. And I started bitching about it. And one day, John Corzine called me back again. He said, all right, you know, Mr. Mr. Bitch about your salary, I got a new job for you. How about move to Hong Kong and run trading? You know, I was too uh, proud to call his bluff, or to not call his bluff, and so uh, I picked up and moved to Hong Kong and had no idea if he'd be a good trader or not a good trader, and sales had come really easy to me. And so I was a bit petrified, and I started this process of learning to trade. And, you know, my first year, I kind of had the bulletproof jacket because Corzin was the boss, and he, you know, he was supporting me and so I went from office to office at Goldman Sachs and uh, sat with all the best traders from the treasury traders to the foreign exchange traders to the credit traders and asked a whole lot of questions and you know got back to Hong Kong after about nine months of touring around and uh, started trading uh, the Asian markets but figured you really couldn't trade the Asian markets without having a link to the uh, the G10 markets to the global markets they were too interconnected and in Asia there wasn't enough liquidity in any one market, so we really were pretty certain that you needed all the, the weapons of liquidity, stocks, bonds, currencies, credits, to really make your bets. And so from the very start of trading, I was always trading what would be, you know, become the global macro you know, palette. It was an Asian focus originally, uh, but trading multi-product and, and multi-region. You know, a lot of times in life, it's being in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know. I was running the desk when the Asian crises hit in 97 for Goldman Sachs. And I used to think each year was like a dog year. You know, we learned seven years of, of work in one year because it was ground zero of the first crises, at least my career. And we navigated ourselves well through the Asian crises. A lot of that was, I think, getting off on the right foot. And once our, our competitors were crippled, there was just more and more business for us. And, you know, we saw more and more of the flow. And through that time, I really started the process of trying to understand risk. Mike, what do you think John Corsine saw in you, singled you out, and put you out to Hong Kong? And more general, what does it take to be a great global macro trader? You know, it's an interesting question. I sometimes think that, you know, I was such a good bullshitter as a sales guy that Corzine decided to put me in a job where you couldn't bullshit. You know, one thing about being a macro trader is that uh, the P&L doesn't lie at the end of the day, and there was a real discipline needed. Being a great macro trader, it, it's interesting. I, I once talked to Paul Jones and said, God, we got to find a, you know, I, there was a test I took uh, and gave my salesman, and it tells you if you're going to be a great salesman or not. I said, man, I wish I could find one for a trader. And he said, man, I spent lots of money trying to de develop a test like that, and there is none. There is a, an instinct, uh, an intuition that macro traders have. My best story, I guess, uh, when I started this hedge fund, I, I hired Ehud Barak, 
the ex-prime minister and, and general from Israel, as a consultant. And he had two other uh, uh, macro funds he was consulting for, uh, Caxton and More Capital. And, and I was a very small hedge fund guy at the time. And so I was flattered that you know I was in the same uh, consultantship with the Hood. And I went out with him one day and he said, Novo, I think I figured you out. You know, you're not so smart. He said, me, I'm smart. But you, you're just lucky. And I looked at him. And he, then he gave me this quote uh, in French, which I didn't understand since I don't speak French, but it was from Napoleon. And it was, I don't hire smart generals, I hire lucky ones. And he went on to explain how Napoleon would, you know, value generals who had a battlefield recognition, who knew would be in the right place at the right time, who had a leadership quality. And since there weren't traits that he could put his finger on, people would call them luck. And he said, macro traders are very simple. And he said, you know, don't feel bad because, you know, Covenor and and Lewis Bacon, they're not so smart either. They're just lucky. And so I got a big kick out of that. But it was a, a literally a, a, a pivotal moment in my understanding because so much of this business is about learning to trust that intuition. And if you don't understand that, that it's a real intelligence, that, that your ability to pattern recognize and to put multiple pieces of information together and have an instinct or a gut feeling that, you're, that you trust, if you don't understand that that's part of the process, you're always scared. And so much of this business is about learning to trust yourself. You know, it's about putting yourself in harm's way when other people are nervous. You can only do that if there's a belief that you have markets are going up or markets are going down. Or, and there's a tremendous amount of instinct that comes into it. I always tell our investors that we're in the guessing business. It gets them a little bit nervous. But it's... We do a whole lot of rigorous work. Uh, we do fundamental analysis, we do technical analysis, we do market psychology, we look at analogs. and That algorithm we have, you know, it, it, there's a whole bunch of people that are involved in it, but it's at the crossroads of that algorithm and your instinct, that precognizant intuition uh, that comes from all the data points that you're dealing with. It's because we just think and we don't know, we're scared shitless. There's a tremendous amount of anxiety in this business. And so the, the genius and the discipline that separates the really good traders is creating a set of rules that you live by, that you run your portfolio by, and that actually you manage your life by, that give you the best chance of having your portfolio be a set of your guesses, a set of your, that, those bets you make. Often it sounds like a tautology. Well, the guy's bullish, he should be long. The great traders, that's true for. You know, uh, I once was talking to one of Soros is uh, Stan Druckenmiller's analyst, and he saw the sign in my office that said, great traders make money when they're right and lose money when they're wrong. And he was like, yeah, that's Druckenmiller. You know, if he's bullish, he's long. If he's bearish, he's short. That's not the case with nine out of 10 guys that try this business. They're bullish, but they're too scared to buy, or they'll sell calls when they're bullish. All of us get tempted by the, the evils. There's a book on my desk somewhere, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. It was written, you know, in the 1930s, and you know the, the game is the same today as it was then. And you know the rules are all in that book. Uh, living by the rules and creating your own version of them is, is really the game. And so, you know, that process has been a for me a 15 year, you know, 15 year process of, of getting better at it. The algorithm you learn doesn't change a ton. You get better because you have more, uh, market history, uh, but your pattern recognition is your pattern recognition. Your, the rules you live by and the discipline you create, uh, that you can keep working on. And so that's really, that's what macro trading is in my mind.